Hello, everybody. Just a heads up, um, I don't think I can hear anybody if they talk. Um, I have no idea why. I never use this laptop. Um, I thought I'd be safe jumping on the MacBook to give a talk rather than trying to get WebEx to work on my development Linux setup. Well, on me, the Mac has also failed me, but hopefully you can all hear me at least. That'd be quite nice. I have joined the chat on my phone, so if you have, thanks for the thumbs up there. Um, I've joined the chat on my phone, so if you want to ask any questions as we go through the talk, I will just answer them as they come up. I have Slack over there on the other screen, so if you ask questions over there, I will also see them. So if you see me turning to left, that's why. Um, this is a 101 talk. We're not going to go into depth on anything. This is for people who have maybe heard of OpenTelemetry or haven't heard of it yet and are interested in getting started with it. And we'd just like to have a nice overview of how everything fits together. So it's in everyone's benefit if you do ask questions as we go along to make sure that I do cover things properly. Got a message over here on Slack. Give me a second. I may actually hear people if they speak. It might be Jonas's problem, not mine. That's nice. So yes, Open Telemetry 101. So hopefully I can. Ah, there we go. That's me. Huzzah. Um, right. So I am a software developer. No big surprise. I do come from the .NET world originally. I went to JavaScript because my wrists got sore using a mouse in Visual Studio. Honest to God, that's the reason. Um, eventually started doing Erlang and the last eight years have been spent doing that remotely with my lovely team and more recently indeed writing PureScript, which is quite cool. If you follow my Twitter, you'll never see me talk about any of those subjects unless I'm trolling the .NET community, which I do from time to time. Um, you'll most likely see me posting pictures of either my dog, coffee or sourdough. My dog is downstairs in her bed, so she doesn't interrupt us during this talk. I apologize for that. I know some people would like to see her. So where am I coming from? About six months ago, we, <laughs> opportune times, <laughs> decided to step back and think about some of the things we do on our platform and whether things work or not, um, which means a general pause on new development and actually step back and sharpen some saws and see what works and see what doesn't work and try and fix some of these things. So one of the things we came up with is, is you know, actually we're doing pretty well. We do actually build software quite quickly. It works really well. Customers don't generally complain all that much. We've got quite a few of them and that's nice. Um, so that's pat on the back there. That's good for us. But runtime issues do cost us money. Um, we're only a very small team. There are, I think, six developers currently. We've got way more than that in terms of clients. Everything is bespoke per client. So we are managing a product or three per client. So if there are issues which we need to diagnose, that takes us away from active software development. And we need to avoid that as much as we possibly can. We do have some really good tools for diagnosing our issues. We've got extensive logging. We're always done everything by a printf it works very well because we're in erlang we can attach to remote nodes and execute arbitrary code on them whenever we want to generally do quite a lot of introspection that way you know um we work in the media and code and delivery um, area and we can attach to running encoders and have a look at various queues within a workflow see whether say hardware accelerations on the fits and that kind of thing um and that's quite handy. There are also plenty of introspection tools built into Erlang itself. Um, yeah, cool. Um, such, as, such as Observer. Um, yeah, the entire thing about Erlang is, in theory, you're building software that you're never going to restart um, because that would, that would involve downtime and telecoms and all that. So obviously the ability to look at things at runtime and patch things at runtime without actually stopping anything is baked right into that. And we have, of course, our own diagramming tools and metrics and such. And you see here, that's um, one of our workflows for our encoder. And that works quite nicely as well. Um, and that's nice, it's all hand-rolled. 
But the thing is, those are tools for us. And we found that if we give customers the ability to see what's going on, our customers can often self-diagnose issues and fix them themselves. They're not stupid. They hire engineers in our industry, that is. And generally, if an encoder goes pop, if they have the information at hand, they can probably work out why and what actually happened there. So we're often asked to integrate with their lovely enterprise logging and monitoring infrastructure, which is all on premise and that's fine and great. One of the ways we can do that is uh, SNMP. Um, I'm sure at this point, if I was in a room with you all, I'd hear some groans. Um, yes, it's not a terribly pleasant thing to use. So we'll move on from that. We can do any old ad hoc in FluxDB, Grafana or whatever, and do pretty dashboards like this. In the past, we've generally found that when we go to the effort of building these dashboards, they're used during the sales meetings and they're never looked at ever again. So they're handy for that, I guess, but so on and so forth. And a common request is to export our logs. Well, I've got news for them. Our logs, while they are quite useful to us, aren't quite useful to them. Warnings like this isn't going to happen appearing in our logs doesn't actually help our customers solve issues so we need to step back and think here a little bit oh i've got a system track four here <laughs> yes um so yes this isn't gonna this isn't supposed to happen is no useful to our customers so we can't just go hey have our logs stick them in log stash and do what you will with them because suddenly our logs become effectively an api that we have to maintain and our logs are for us. Thank you very much. So the thing is, standards are actually quite useful. Um, we'll ignore SNMP. And that's led us to go and look at open telemetry. So what happened here was I was tasked with going to look at what is our observability story going to be over the next year or two. And I did some Googling, as one does when looking at new things. And I came across the observability working group for Erlang and the observability working group for Erlang linked to open telemetry. And I found out there's a whole pile of people getting very excited about open telemetry. Most of them are Elixir developers um, rather than Erlang developers because Erlang developers are stuck in the seventies, I imagine. And um, that's, that includes us too, obviously. Um, but the Elixir developers are well on this They They love open telemetry. They've had some things for doing this for a long time. They've had open metrics and open tracing and open telemetry is actually just a, um, a step forward from that, shall we say. I actually went on the website earlier to see what they said open telemetry was because while I, I'm using it every day at work now, I couldn't actually give a definition. And apparently it's a collection of tools, APIs and SDKs, which are used to instrument, generate, collect and export telemetry data. Very exciting. Um, but that kind of makes sense. You want to, analyze our performance and behavior, good stuff. The cool thing about open telemetry is that the specification itself is open source. It's up there in GitHub and you can make pull requests to it. The specification and documentation effectively live side by side or are the same thing. And for more or less, it's all vendor neutral. And that's really nice. The problem with vendor driven initiatives is very often you end up with a standard that benefits a single vendor and actually trying to build extensions off that that actually work anywhere else doesn't really work terribly well. But the vendors are involved. If you go to the meetings, and there are a lot of meetings, let me tell you, um, if there's a Google Calendar on online, I think there's a six or seven meetings every single day of the week. Um, people get involved and talk about what needs to be done and people from various vendors turn up to those meetings to say, well, actually that won't work for us. This thing needs to work this way and so on and so forth. Uh, that's, that's quite nice. It's a nice way of working. Obviously it's built as an open standard and we all know the problem with standards is once we actually have a standard, someone will end up building another standard on top of that and so on and so forth. And that's already happening with this thing. You know, people diverge slightly and there are some competing things happening already. Whatever. Um, don't really mind too much. The benefits of using an open standard outweigh pontificating between trying to pick different ones. Um, so there's a the URL for the specification on GitHub. And effectively, that specification lists what modules you should expect to see in any implementation, what functions should exist in the implementation, and what the code layout should be in any of those implementations. And of course, things like version strategies and such like that. And that's quite interesting because what we're saying here is no matter what language you work in day to day, 
at work um, for your products, the use of open telemetry should largely look the same across those languages and platforms because it has been written as thus. Now, obviously, there's a little bit of difference in interpretation if you're in a functional language versus an OOP language or whatever. Um, but by and large, this tends to work quite well because people from both of those camps attend those meetings and have it out on Zoom. So you can find all the implementation for languages on GitHub as well over here. So there's the Go one, the Erlang one, the Python one, so and so forth, um, whatever. Now I'll dive right into look at tracing, I think. That's the most simple thing. So, um, first off, let's just say what is tracing? Well, originally, if I said tracing, I would think of graphs like this. This is a flame graph from Dtrace. And typically these things we use at a low level to understand what a piece of software is doing and where it's spending its time and so on and so forth. And that's quite useful. But the problem is things have changed and now our architecture diagrams look like this for some reason. Um, I don't know when this happened. I, I, I just closed my eyes and opened them one day and people were doing microservices and this is what things now look like. This is, that's, that's Monzo's architecture, apparently. Um, that's cool for them. So tracing is actually more now about finding out what happened and how we got there and where even here is. You know, if something goes wrong in this architecture, if a microservice goes pop or decides to start erroring out, it's all very well and good looking at its logs. But unless you understand the wider context of how that fault occurred, you're not really going to be able to make any meaningful attempt at fixing it. Um, but that's, that's, that's quite important. So take our example originally for warning, this is not supposed to happen. I've removed the curse word because I'm professional. What more information could we expose against this log message? Well, we could quite easily attach a call stack. That's quite normal. If, if things crash, having a call stack's normally quite a useful thing to have. We could determine what actually happened to cause this call stack to be invoked in the first place. Hey, user clicked a button. Well, that's a useful thing to know, isn't it? We could attach information such as uh, the database with access to these queries, you know. Um, this is the database that was accessed. This is where it was accessed. We can attach the information such as, I don't know, um, where the user was connecting from, which server did they connect to, which host name they used to connect to that server. And indeed, at the infrastructure level, which servers are being used underneath the, underneath the surface. This is all useful information to know when trying to diagnose issues in a system. You could you, now with structured logging, you could do this. You could quite happily pile a whole heap of stuff into a structured log and have all of this as a pile of text in a file. And that would certainly work. Um, but it's actually slightly more convenient to think in terms of more high grain concepts and. open telemetry and tracing comes into things. So what you have is the open telemetry tracing API is generally per application, you will configure a tracer. And that is used to get instances of any object you might use within the tracing API to write any things like traces. The default implementation is a no-op and we'll come back to this. But essentially the idea is when you are writing code to trace your libraries that you are writing and the software that you are writing, you don't actually want to know anything about the implementation behind that. You just want to write traces and attach information and do so in a common way that everyone else will understand. When I write my library to, I don't know, uh, shuffle bytes around on my disk or stream some video somewhere. I want to be able to trace stuff out. I want to write call all the API methods to do that, but I don't actually want them to do anything by default because I don't want to know how the application is configured. And I'm sure we're all familiar with that in .NET. You've got your iLogger or iLog or whatever. You, the implementation is generally something you want to leave to the, um, to the application using your code. So at the very beginning of the application, you'll generally set things up and say, well, okay, I want to use this tracing provider for my application and all the libraries will get involved and do that. 
Now, underneath the API, generally, we have three concepts we need to know about. The first one is spans. I think of spans as being analogous to call stacks. Um, generally, how did I get here is a useful thing to know. This is a picture I stole from the Lightstack blog. It's a very useful place to learn about open telemetry if you're so inclined later on. In order to do any operation with an open telemetry, you'll want to create a span. And a span is just a bag of context saying where I currently am. And spans can nest. So generally what you'll do is you'll create a top level span for a user request. And when actions happen underneath that request, you'll create further spans and they'll belong to the parent span and it'll go all the way down. And that's very handy. Attached to spans are attributes. And attributes are very useful too. Attributes are a list of key value pairs where the value can actually be any one of these things, a string, boolean, float, or an integer, or indeed a list of further values. And this enables you to do things like say, for the context of this whole span, this is the user that was doing this operation. This is the host that the user came in on. This is the IP address of this server. Thank you very much. Here is the context for this span. And when you go and do operations with that span, such as writing events, which I can see is over here, that context will be effectively attached to those events. Actually, it's not denormalized at this point. It needs to be put somewhere else before that happens. But the idea is you will be creating spans, attaching events to those spans, and there will be attributes attached to the span. Now, you can also, it says just here, more attributes can be added to events. You can indeed do that. So on a per event basis, you can say, well, yes, this is this event. And yes, I inherit all my spans context but here's some further context to let you know why this thing actually happened thank you very much and um, the only thing event has is a name and a timestamp really and that name's actually quite a useful thing because you might want to query on that so it's generally not just a big long arbitrary piece of text it's normally something quite short and pithy um, something i'm pretty good at so um there we go um a span has multiple attributes but a span has multiple events attached to it and those events will have a collection of attributes associated with them. Wonderful. Now, that all said and done isn't something that you or I couldn't just develop ourselves. There's nothing special about that. I mean, we've been building netted context out of IOC containers for years. Um, but there are some useful things you can do if you adopt an open standard for how you're going to do your tracing and library implementers also do the same because what happens in a distributed environment when you have an action carried out by a user hitting a front-end service here we have the user pressed a button the action starts there thank you very much we know where the user came in on we know what browser they used we hit the service layer and decide to execute a command and we start a span for that so we can do this thing. And then we call the transaction service, which is for some reason is a service someone's written to do transactions for us. I don't know why they've done that, but microservices are cool, so that's what they've done. And that span's got its own context. For example, um, I'm sitting currently running on this service and this is my and this is the source IP by which this request came in on. That's wonderful, except I don't know why that transaction got started. I don't know what the context is associated with that. And what you can do at the service layer is send baggage over the wire. And it actually is called baggage, and I actually quite like that name, I have to admit. Um, you can send baggage over to whichever open semi implementation you're using and send that along. So that can be bundled along with the spans and events being written on that microservice. And the idea is, and again, it's only an idea because I haven't seen too many people Im implement this yet, um, is that you can bake this into the communication infrastructure that you use to get your message around in the first place. For example, in Erlang, we tend to use Cowboy as a web server. That's what it's called, it's called Cowboy. Ask me later why it's called Cowboy. 
Um, and we use something called Spudgon to send HTTP requests to those servers. It's not actually difficult to write some middleware for Cowboy that understands exactly what baggage looks like and then automatically create a span and a context based on that when starting a request and handle this at the infrastructure level. So my code doesn't actually have to worry about where context is coming from. That's super handy. Um, and again, you know, the patterns for that are baked right into the standard itself. And I find that very interesting. So the implementation looks a bit like this. You'll request an instance of the current tracer. You'll go and create some spans using that tracer. You'll attach events to those spans and you'll end those spans and that will cause them to effectively be exported. Very handy. Profit, indeed. Now, obviously, service locators are very 1990, and I've already seen some arguments about this, mostly from the enterprise crowd, because they actually care about these things. Um, but uh, effectively, this is what it ends up looking like. You are in some code, you need the tracer, you call out to a, fac to a service locator to go and get the factory, and that's all fine and great. The reason it's done that way is because it's very implementation agnostic. If you want to go and do that with um, dependency injection, either through an ISC container or otherwise, you're free to go and do that. But the actual spec itself just says, look, I need to go and get a trace from somewhere, and this is a way of doing that. But what this actually means is when you're sat inside library code, you don't need to hook that library code up to anything in order for it to then go and get an implementation of the tracer. So as I mentioned earlier, when I'm sat in a library writing code and I'm not writing this code for an application specifically, I just want to go and get the tracer and do operations with it. And by default, those are all going to be in no-op. I don't want to have to bake in IOC container support to my library. I don't want to have to, be, to build my API around being past this thing. No, I just want to go and get it. Thank you very much. And that's why it's been done this way. And the idea is when the application starts up, it instantiates the implementation and that library code will then be able to go and get an actual trace and do things with it. And indeed, you can then go and turn things off if you don't want tracing from certain modules and such. And that's all very controllable at the top level. It's incredibly handy. So what actually happens in most code is you'll normally go and get an instance of the current tracer, you'll get the current span, and you'll write events to it. Generally, you'll not actually be creating spans, you'll generally not be doing any configuration, you'll just go and get the current tracer and write some events, thank you very much. In languages that support macros, generally, this is all put into a single macro anyway, which is write event, and that macro will go and do the number one and two for you. Um, I'm sure in C Sharp, you can think of many creative ways of wrapping this thing up. Generally, things like traces and spans are bound to the current thread whose operation you're in. Um, I actually left C Sharp before you guys got the async stuff, so I've got no idea how that works in your world, but hey-ho, I'm sure someone will find a way. So most code will only do those things. An application setup, you'll normally configure open telemetry with tracing providers, some exporters saying where the day is going to go, and then you'll go and create spans before invoking code at service boundaries somehow. And indeed, if you are leaning on an IRC container to do things like your unit of work implementation or such, um, it's not too hard to envisage actually hooking it up so that when you call functions on things like, I don't know, ASP.NET MVC web handlers, that you're given the tracer or the current span that you're operating within as part of the function call. You can well imagine that's exactly what you'd be doing. Don't know for sure though. So what's that actually look like in practice? Well, in Python, you get, there's you get, there's you get your tracer, start span and writing an event to that spam. In JavaScript, getting a tracer, starting a span, and writing an event to that span. In Erlang, beautiful Erlang, look at those commas and full stops. Getting a tracer, starting a span, and adding an event to that span. You can see a pattern emerging here. In PureScript, same thing again. I had to put PureScript there because my little baby. Um, but all these things look the same, which is nice, except for C-sharp, which doesn't look the same. Ah, okay. 
Uh, it was a great surprise to me a few months ago when I came across this. I was looking at the implementations for OpenTelemetry across the different platforms and seeing how they achieve certain things, especially with regards to metrics, which we'll talk about soon. And I came across this little thing in C Sharp, which says, well, we have different names for things because we kind of only had code to do this and we're not going to change things. And also span is an overloaded term in C Sharp and so on and so forth. And actually looking back in the mailing lists and on Twitter, and indeed I got involved as well, had a little argument and forth. As <laughs> a lot of uh, opinionated people out there who either get angry about this or really don't care at all. Um, whatever. The key thing is some things have effectively been renamed if you're in C Sharp. And that's not really fair, really, because C Sharp got their first. C Sharp, or .NET, should I say, had a very rich tracing setup while OpenTelemetry was being developed. And it didn't really make sense to go and redo that by renaming a whole pile of stuff. But things work together. And if you look at the documentation for C Sharp, it normally refers back and says, OK, well, if you're looking at spans, those are activities. Attributes are tags and events are still events. Don't worry about it. There's no point in getting frustrated about it. The decision has been made and it doesn't actually matter all that much. The key thing is on, underneath the hood, things will still be talking in terms of the concepts and constructs we have already mentioned. And what's kind of good is given that you are all excellent .NET developers already, the chances are that you are already doing things with activities, tags, and events because everybody loves tracing and we're all incredibly ops friendly and therefore have been doing this since the API came out, right? Absolutely, I can see you all nodding. I can't see you all nodding. My bandwidth is absolutely terrible, but I'll assume you're all nodding and say, yes, we are all doing this already. So good news, you're already using OpenTelemetry if you're using activities in C Sharp. Cool beans. So now, you have traces, what do you actually want to do with them? And this is kind of cool because there are multiple places for sticking traces and spans and such. And you all understand the terminology that we are talking about here in OpenTelemetry. So here's Zipkin over here. There's a nice little span graph there with some events at the bottom of it. Here's Jaeger, which I've managed to misspell in that little bullet. Here's New Relic with a similar looking UI, and here's Lightstep with yet another UI with steps and such. I don't have an opinion. <laughs> Good gif. I haven't got an opinion on which of these tools one should use to store their spans. They all look the same to me anyway, and also... Generally, I already have a whole pile of tools for introspecting our software. This is for our clients to choose from, and I don't want to have to choose this. Chances are they've already got something installed that can handle this, and we want to push to that. So that's kind of cool. You get pretty graphs for free. Wonderful. But you want to get information into these pieces of software, and there's some decisions to be made at this point. So you can write your app, and you can use a built-in in-process exporter which just dumps things directly into your Jaeger, is it, I spelled it there too, Jaeger, Zipkin, and New Relic, and such. And this works really well for local development or just getting started. It works really well where you only have one or two services set up to do this. I know it works really well um, if you're just building yet another CMS, and that's absolutely fine. But there are some issues with this approach. Primarily, the issue is actually down to resource usage. You generally go and you need to store all these spans and traces before they get exported to whichever software you're wanting to use, and that needs to happen inside your application in process. The other big problem is that you end up then having to do language specific integration for each vendor tool. So over here, where I've got my in process exporter, export to Jaeger or Zipkin. Well, in C-sharp, I'll need to write a C-sharp Jaeger exporter and a C-sharp Zipkin exporter. And in Erlang, I'll need to write an Erlang Jaeger exporter and an Erlang Zipkin exporter. 
in languages where you have lots of developers happily bashing out open source stuff within their niches, um, that's not such a huge problem. I can imagine in .NET that there'd be people happy to build exporters to the cows come home. I work in Erlang. There's probably two or three open source developers who actually build things on the planet. Um, they build very useful things and we use them every single day, but most of the time, open source Erlang is a case of someone wrote something to solve that problem and then abandoned it, never to speak of it ever again. So it's not terribly useful to us um, in, our, in, our, in our platform. And also the problem is the integration is part of the app release itself. So that means that if I want to add a different exporter, and put things in New Relic now, I have to redeploy my application to do that, or at the very least reconfigure it. And that's not really all that useful. Most likely redeploy because I'm gonna to have to actually download the library that does that thing. Um, and that's fine if you've got a single application deployment, but it's not fine if your architecture diagram looks like Monzo's one earlier, the big bag of microservices. No, that's not terribly useful at all. So what we've got in the open telemetry world, as well as the standard and the specification, is actually a specification standard for what is known as the open telemetry collector. And as well as a specification and standard, there's also an implementation. Um, I believe it's written in Go. We shouldn't hold that against it. Um, but the idea is that you can run an open telemetry exporter out of outside collector, sorry, outside of your application. And that can be responsible for then talking to Jaeger, Zipkin, et cetera, which means it can be independently deployed and support for those things only have to be written once. And that's kind of cool. That's actually incredibly useful. And I guess even more useful when you start doing things like this and you spin up multiple applications on a single host, I don't know, inside dock containers or something, whatever's cool these days. And they can all push to a single OTEL collector that's just sat there on that single host. Or indeed, and if you've got a dispute of microservices architecture, you might want to have a single OTEL collector sat there on its own infrastructure and things can be configured to talk to that. And they can and that can go and push into Jaeger, Zipkin, and etc. Now this represents quite a useful step for us because suddenly the memory pressure and the infrastructure concerns for managing your spans and traces and such can all be dealt with by whoever's job it is to run the hotel collector which in an enterprise organization as much as we like to wave the devops term around probably isn't going to be the dev team it's probably going to be the ops team because we probably still have one of those and that's the kind of thing they like to do um, that is just the way the world works still. And that's kind of nice. They can go and play with that to their heart's content. And if they decide they want a different back end, they can go and do that. And the applications can carry on running because they've been told, well, the collector's over there. And in fact, that's not even how that works. The collector's been told the app's over there. Even different, it's even the other way around. Super cool. So yes, the open telemetry collector means you have an independent deployment set up. You can offload all that work to an external host if you need to, and there's no need for language integrations, which in Erlang is wonderful because it means we haven't got to write our own for a change, which is what we have to do if we wanted to use an Erlang exporter. For example, in our test setup for now, we are using Dipkin and Prometheus and Grafana, and that's fine and great. I've had to modify all the plugins to keep up to date with the latest open telemetry implementation in Erlang. And that's a fork that we have to look after because other people haven't done that yet. And that problem only grows exponentially across the number of languages and number of implementations that need to be created. Bit of a faff. So yes, we'll leave that one to the experts and just shove our spans, traces and such into the collector. Thank you very much. So in some of the things, Generally, the idea is, or the hope is, that everybody will start writing all their library code against traces and spans and add events to them. And they'll all go and honorably create spans for new contexts. We'll all have support for flowing context between services using whatever web um, client you're using. I'm, I have no idea what you're using.NET these days for sending HTTP requests, but I, I imagine you have 
the ability to do that baked in, and I imagine it probably could support this stuff by default and add events for everything. So when I'm building my crappy library to move bytes from one part of my disk to another, I can make sure it's traced up to the hilt and not actually worry about the implementation at any point in practice. Now, as it actually happens, the way this is actually going down as it currently stands is rather than tie themselves to open telemetry, library implementers are just allowing configuration and, and saying, well, actually, if you want to use open telemetry with our library, here are the extension points to go and do that, which is a bit disappointing, but I can understand why that is because open telemetry wanting to be the standard is a noble goal, but not necessarily one that they'll ever win. Um, everybody wants to be the standard and they can't be the standard because there are always going to be another one out there. But the cool thing is you can export traces to whatever tool you want from there, either by in process or using the collector. And I do mean everything. In our software now, if, if something happens, you add a trace for it. Um, it's up to the application as it starts up to configure itself to either decide it wants tracing in certain areas or not. And that's fine. And you can even do things like configure the collector to say, drop every 99 out of 100 messages coming from part system if you decide it's a really heavy heavy part system if you only want a statistical view of roughly what's going on on a, on a busy environment you can do that and that's fine so more tracing the better really now metrics are actually more interesting uh, as far as i'm concerned anyway because we have hand rolled our metrics implementations since ever in the Erlang world, um, we have large workflows containing processors whose job it is to move or transform or do things with video or audio streams by the frame or by the packet or whatever. And the design of that has never been quite clear. So we've always come up with our own way of doing it. And Surprise, surprise, our way isn't the best way because people who are cleverer than us have come up with better ways of handling these things. It didn't occur to me that um, pull-based systems for metrics would be remotely harmful in any way. And it turns out, actually, they're not very useful. You need to support push-based metrics if you want good performance and so and so and so forth. We can talk about that later if you want to. Um, but anyway, the, stat, the patterns and standards in open telemetry kind of leads down a happy path, and that makes us quite happy. Um, and more importantly, we can get shiny graphs that impress our customers without actually tying ourselves to any kind of technology, which means earlier when I showed you that lovely Grafana screenshot, we can still go and generate those, but just because we're generating shiny Grafana screenshots doesn't mean that Grafana is the only thing we support, which up until now has been the case. Um, if somebody wants something else, we can go and implement it, and that's a bit of a pain, really. So similar to tracing, um, you have meters. Uh, this is confusing to me when I first looked at it, because um, to me, a meter is, is not what a meter is in open telemetry. So let's go with definitions of open telemetry here. A meter is configured per application and is used to get instances of the instruments we are going to be writing to. And again, by default, everything is in no op. So this is analogous to the tracer earlier. You want to have per application or per domain a meter which you're going to do things with. So scoped to a meter are instruments. Good name for something too. Now an instrument has a name and a type. And that's all it has. They're scoped to the meter that initially created them, and that's useful. And they're generally defined up front as part of your library setup and the names are really important and this is really this is, this is a crucial thing when we first started creating our instruments not understanding open country having not rtfm'd um we were trying to create namespaced names and it turns out that's a silly thing to do um names are short names are um, meant to be reused names are not the key differentiating factor between values written to instruments. Instruments can have 
a number of different properties. They can be push or pull, that is synchronous or asynchronous. They can be monotonic or not. That is to say, they can just go up or they can have a value that fluctuates or a value that goes up or down and so on and so forth. And that's important to know. And they can be additive or grouping in their behavior. So an additive instrument would be a case of, I write a value to the instrument and it increments a counter. Um, a grouping one would be, I write a value to my instrument and it works out my rolling average as we go along. Two, our recorded values are associated with the instruments we used to write them. A list of labels, and a label is a lot like an attribute tracing, only keys and values are limited to strings only. This is really important. So if I've got myself an instrument over here of a name and a type, and I want to write a value to it, I need to supply not only the value, but the labels associated with that value when I write the instrument. And that's the standard. Synchronous instruments have the lovely ability to build the labels from the current span context. And that's really useful too, um, obviously. You know, if you're operating within a particular service operation, it might be useful when writing metrics to have that information exported as part of the value you are writing. So let's go and look at a specific instrument type and see what this looks like in terms of code and implementation, because this is the easiest way to understand what an instrument is. We'll look at the simplest, or to my mind, the simplest type of instrument, which is a counter. So down here, I've, I've listed the three properties of a counter. They are synchronous, the monotonic, and the additive. These are defaults. And let's say, I've written a processor that receives video frames, and I want to record how many frames it receives over time. That is to say, I've got a function that's receiving a video frame whenever it does. Probably 25 times a second or thereabouts. That's how <laughs> video tends to work. We want to record these frames as we receive them. That would imply it's synchronous. That is to say, whenever I receive a frame, I'm going to write a value to my counter. You don't have negative frame counts. That doesn't happen. You don't lose frames. Um, if you receive a frame, the number of frames you received goes up. So this kind of uh, instrument type is clearly monotonic. And the value we do record can be added to previous values in order to give our total over time, hence it's additive. So if I want to know how many frames I receive every hour, that's a question I can ask of a counter by giving it values I give it. So how does it work? Well, I'll go and get the meter and type my app. I'll create an instrument belonging to that meter. So here we go. Um, I managed to complete wrong one here, whatever. Mind, whatever. Um, and I'm going to write a value to that instrument with some labels. So there you go. There's some, there's my value and some labels. I've actually used the wrong example here. That's a bit of a shame, but never mind. Um, the other type of instrument we might want to look at for simplicity point of view is value recorder, which is also synchronous, but it's not monotonic, um, but it is grouping. So, for example, if I'm receiving a process video frames, I might want to record how big those frames are as they come in. How many bytes are they? That's the example I just showed, actually. So, obviously, it's synchronous because we're going to do it as the frames come in. The size of the frame is going to go up or down as it comes in. It doesn't make any sense for it to keep going up and up unless we want to receive, unless we want to have a counter called total bytes, at which point that would be a counter. But no, we want to have a look at the size of the frames over time. So they're definitely not monotonic. And when we add them together to do a total, that's not what we're doing here. We want to see averages over time. So it would imply this is a grouping counter. Um, Yes, and that's the example I just showed, so cool. So um, when we're, in the code example I just showed, um, we wrote the value and the labels at the same time. So the name of the instrument used to record them is part of that value. The meter the instrument belonged to is also part of that value. And the unique combinations of the labels associated with that recorded value 
um, is also then can use, use differentiate the values written to the store. So instruments are designed to be used by multiple consumers with their own distinct combinations of labels. The code example I just showed doesn't make any sense uh, because I'm having to specify the labels constantly all the time. The instruments and application needs should be defined up front for a little bit of thought. thought. Indeed, they should. Um, so what we were doing originally in our code base when we first jumped in Gunco saying we're going to use open telemetry was we started defining instruments per processor, as it were, and that's kind of absolutely not how it works. Um, instruments generally are a global concept for your application. The names of the instruments are going to be thought about quite carefully. Things like frame count, for example, is a fairly standard term that you can really understand and everything you can use. So you can search for all the frame counts across your entire application. So for example, if we've got a workflow with a thousand processes in it, we can have a thousand different frame counts if you group them by their distinct values. Um, and that's quite useful because I can see um, how much latency there is from the beginning of the system to the end of the system across the processor chain. Um, this is marvelous stuff, really. But the example I just showed had us um, writing the labels as we wrote the value, and that's quite inefficient because generally these things need grouping in memory before they get sent off to a collector. So for this purpose, we have a concept in open telemetry known as bound instruments. And this is generally what you'll do. You can hold the application meter, you'll create an instrument belonging to that meter, and you'll then call bind on that instrument, passing in a label set. So here, how we sample the common, so on and so forth. There you go, and codec H264, wonderful stuff. And then I can write a value to that counter without passing in the label set. And indeed, again and again and again as data comes in. And that gives us a pattern, actually, for using the instruments in our code. Um, we shall get, we shall get to you soon. Um, the idea is the banishments can be created up front for labels needed, and there is an assumed performance penalty for not doing this. In reality, there's not really that much of one, but if you've got a, a thousand um, instruments or hundred instruments in your application and several thousand distinct types of value, that's a whole lot of lookups you need to do in order to write values um, based on those labels as they get written and it can be a bit of a bottleneck CPU-wise. Whereas if you create a bound instrument, you can opt, the implementation can optimize by creating a reference, for example, based on the label set and write via that reference instead. Um, that could be a thing that it does, which is nice. Collection then starts looking a lot like it does in the tracing world. So again, you, know, you can have an exporter, which is invoked every collection interval from Prometheus Influx or whatever. And the values get stored in process until they are collected. Just because you're writing frames uh, every time they come in, 25 times a second, doesn't mean you want to call Prometheus 25, time, 25 times a second. That's not it at all. Prometheus will most likely be configured to call the application once every second or once every five seconds and say, what are all the values that you have seen since I last spoke to you? And that's how that generally works. And it's up to the application and the implementation of open telemetry to know what to do with those types of instruments to make these kind of calls possible. But the problem is a high cardinality of labels means a lot of potential memory pressure and also indeed CPU pressure. For example, if you have a label or an instrument called frame count and I've got a thousand processes each of the label set, that's a thousand different values being kept in memory and aggregated on and counted on before being shipped off every second or seconds. In the case of things like averages or such, um, the grouping instruments, it actually has to keep some of that, those values around in memory in order to create the calculations itself. So it's not terribly good to hold all of that in memory because it also means if the application dies for the flex interval, you lose all the data and also per vendor you have to implement the thing, which is just bleh. Um, again, hate writing code, but prefer someone to do it for us. So thank you for the, the open telemetry collector will do this for us. It can happily pull the data from our applications or indeed we can push to the open telemetry collector as we get it. And um, it can be responsible for then palming off to Prometheus every collection interval. And it also means that there can be some standard ways of tidying up that data. 
So one of the things that developers traditionally misunderstand with cardinality and label sets of metrics is how to reduce cardinality or how to limit cardinality. And um, that's kind of okay if you have some business knowledge on how to then reduce that cardinality at the point of putting it into Prometheus. And whoever's responsible for looking at, after the collector can do that for you, which is nice. So developers can get on and spin as much data as they want to into their metrics and leave it all for ops to sort out later on. Um, and that's, that's, that's a nice way of working, unless you're ops. Um, so yeah, singlet instruments are push-based as far as the code is concerned, but the value needs to be kept in memory somewhere until read by the integration, but they can be written to as and when are needed. And they can indeed use the current span context to build label sets. But async instruments don't work that way. They only get read once per collection interval, and they have no access to span context. They've not covered those yet. So going back to that diagram over here, you've got a collection interval coming over every five seconds, asking your app, what's the current state of the world? When it gets asked that, that's when you want to go and read an asynchronous instrument. And the way you do that is, for example, with a value observer like this, which is asynchronous, non-monotonic, non-grouping. For example, an encoder would like to record how much GPU it's using over time. Well, it's clearly, it makes no sense to be writing the GPU every time it changes because it's going to be changing all the time. What's the granularity of that? It doesn't make sense for us to have a timer and sample that ourselves because why would we? No, what you want to do is give open telemetry a callback and say, when you want to know what the value is for this, ask me and I'll tell you what it is. It's the value at a point in time, it's, it's not monotonic, it's not keep going up, um, but you want to work at averages and peaks. So it's probably a grouping type. So we'll get hold of our application meter. We'll create an instrument belonging to that meter, which is a value observer. We'll set a call back up by subscribing to GPU usage. We'll get given an object called record in this case, which we can then write to whenever we are invoked. And that's how you'll do that. So generally you'll have two types of meter in two types of instruments in your application. You'll have your synchronous ones, which everything has a handle to and is writing. And you'll have your async ones, which are passing information like this every time the collection is performed. Generally, what we'll do is we'll define all of our instruments up front and bung them in a record like this. So as frame count, byte size, and GPU usage, so on and so forth. In our modules and classes, we'll have bound instruments in the module state. In init, when we set up, we'll pass in the config, the record completely with all the instruments and we'll bind the instruments we care about and store the bound instruments in our state. Um, this would be equivalent to you having an ASP.NET MVC controller that in the constructor gets given the total collection of instruments, does a bind operation against those instruments, stashes them somewhere in member state, and then writes those instruments during the actual callbacks for, I don't know, sending data down to the client. Um, all fairly standard stuff, really. So indeed, during our process input call, I can then do things like record, frame count, length, input. Thank you very much. Nice standard patterns. This is the complete list of actually all the types of um, instruments you might want to create in open telemetry. Turns out this pretty much encompasses everything you might ever want to do with metrics. Some very clever people have sat down and argued about this array a long time, and this is what they came up with. Um, Behavior of these can actually change depending on how you configure them, but the default implementations are indeed that counter up, down, and value are all synchronous and with adding monotonous and so on and so forth. Happy days. So, open telemetry itself isn't complete, um, which <laughs> I know I just gave a talk about at the conference and we're jumping wholeheartedly into it ourselves. Um, but it's, it's not even gone GA yet. It's, tracing is going to go GA anytime soon. They're trying to finalize things and just sort out how they're going to version tracing and metrics independently of each other. But the idea is once tracing has gone GA, people can actually start using it properly. Metrics can, can soon follow it. Um, there are plans to do things around logging and there are indeed other infrastructure concerns um, telemetry-wise, which are going to end up getting grouped into open telemetry, but tracing and metrics are the two main ones. 
I believe that the .NET implementation of metrics is going to mirror the spec as .NET itself hasn't got an implementation of anything that looks like it just yet. So that'd be nice. Um, it's always kind of cool when um, standards are adopted by people in well. In terms of us, well, we're jumping just straight, straight in, really. We're adopting OpenTelemetry across our entire application because our own abstractions kind of suck and the ones it gives us are pretty good. And even if OpenTelemetry dies on its ass, um, at the end of the day, we've got a pile of interfaces. We'll just rewrite our code against its interfaces and do, do things our own way. The code's not going to go anywhere, is it? Um, <laughs> But it's really cool because outside of the demos we have to do to sell our products in the first place, we can defer the technology decisions until we actually deploy to our customers on site, um, which means if they already have Grafana um, or they already have um, uh, Lightstep or they already have um, Splunk or so on and so forth, that's fine. doesn't bother us. We can just configure the appropriate exporter and everything will be fine or even better the customer might even by then have an open telemetry collector sat there monitoring their own systems and now i that's wishful thinking because most of our customers are very enterprise and therefore it'll be five or ten years until they actually get on board of anything like this um, but we're there we're waiting for them which is super exciting and cool um, so I, I highly recommend if you haven't looked into any of this stuff at all yet playing with it um, and the easiest thing to do is pull down a Docker uh, manifest or two and just spin up Zipkin and Grafana and Prometheus. There's actually some, I, I again, I don't use Docker very much. I, I run on Nixos, so I, I, don't, I don't need it. Um, but I believe you can do some orchestration in Docker these days quite easily by actually spinning up multiple Docker containers using a single file. And there's some out there for doing this with this setup. Um, and if you spin all these things up and go and write some code in your chosen language that goes and speaks to those things, you will see data appear in those things. It's very exciting. Um, your product managers will absolutely love you for it. And your ops team will absolutely wet themselves when they see what beautiful things you can give them for analyzing what's going on in the application. Um, so that's cool. That is I, I actually the only time I'll ever recommend Docker is for developing things like this. Um, Anyway, hopefully this was a reasonably good one-on-one. As I say, I'm not an expert. Um, I, I've just been responsible for our implementation and getting to grips on that. Um, I've actually managed to run just up to time, which is a surprise, so I probably haven't got time for questions. Um, but that said, I am around on Slack and Twitter and such if you want to ask me anything. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much for coming to my lovely talk about open telemetry.